very much. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a professional. Uh, uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Walker White, uh, president of BDNA. Um, uh, what, uh, BDNA is just a, a little dr backdrop of who we are and why we're here. Uh, we, we help organizations make better business decisions by providing the industry's most authoritative enterprise IT data, and by that I refer to hardware and software and the purchases of hardware and software. Um, so, so why are we here today? Um, because the pattern that BDNA operates for our customers in uh, IT, uh, we already are doing in the medical device space and are running pilots with some other commercial companies in the Internet of Things space. Um, and uh, it was Dan Castro who stood up and talked a little bit about some of these companies that were doing remarkable things. Um, there was Rio Tinto, there was John Deere, he mentioned Verizon. All three of those companies are, are BDNA customers today. So. Um, we, if, if you have, if you're going to be managing the life cycle of any class of assets, uh, basically we provide the data you need to do it, basically clean, efficient, uh, uh, cleaned up data. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a pragmatic, uh, pragmatic person, um, and so uh, 10 minutes is not a long time to give a talk, and a picture's worth a thousand words, so uh, it's mostly pictures I'm going to go through here, but uh, just a, a, a brief aside on that, because there's an exception to every rule. I was in Toronto about two weeks ago and my computer, my laptop broke and you know how they're made, they're like the plastic is like jammed together and you need something to kind of pry them apart if you're trying to fix something inside them. So I needed a knife um, and I was like, oh, I'll go downstairs and I'll get a knife. And so I, I went outside in the hotel room and right across from me, a guy had put his tray out, you know, and just a little bit of food left on it, but there was a knife and it was still in the thing. And I was like, well, I'll just grab the knife there. So I bent over to pick up this knife and then he comes out of the door to go down to the gym so this picture did not tell the story that I was hoping it would tell. And I was reaching for his tray of half-eaten food and it, it just didn't, didn't come across well. Um, so anyway, uh, we'll jump into the, into the pictures here. So uh, history is a, is a very valuable teacher if we're willing to uh, take the lessons of history. Um, all of you are probably very familiar with the adoption curves of technology. It's, you know, we see it certainly <clears throat> in the areas of Facebook and you know, cell phone adoption, but these adoption curves have, have uh, existed for a long, long time. They, you know, whether it's radio, television, color TVs, VCRs, uh, uh, it's really remarkable the, the rate of adoption of, of new technologies. Um, but in, in the kind of the dirty little secret of an organization that needs to manage devices that are being adopted very, very rapidly, um, uh, the management of these devices tends to lag behind the adoption curve. And you get a kind of a picture that looks a little bit like this, right? Where our, in our rush to basically bring in these new technologies, our ability to actually keep control of those things in our environment uh, uh, tends to lag behind. Um, we see this uh, most recently in virtualization where, you know, virtualization got out of the lab before everyone ever really expected it to. It led to huge sprawl, huge cost uh, inside organizations while still saving people a lot of money, but introducing a whole new set of things. Uh, and those things really, in that, in that gap between our ability to adopt that and our ability to manage that environment, we're really presented with three primary things we run into. Uh, one of them is, of course, the first and foremost is, of course, risk. Right, um, the uh, you know security risk, uh, risk of the environment, uh, business operational, and so on. Uh, there was a great demonstration just done uh, with the remote takeover of a, of a Jeep Grand Cherokee. You've all probably read about it, right? Someone took it over, drove it left, right, and brought, hit the brakes, and so on. I drive a Jeep Grand Cherokee, and I I think what's great about that is actually that when I get pulled over next time, I'll be like, it wasn't me, right? <laughs> just some guy, you know, in his pajamas driving my car. So I, I'm looking forward to that. Um, so uh, the second thing that leads to then is that kind of rapid adoption and loss of management. You start to build in inefficiency. There's inefficiencies come, and we don't tend to tend to realize the benefits of a lot of these systems. Um, and uh, the ultimately, it, it introduces a, a net new stream of costs. And, and Bill Wallace mentioned it earlier about the uh, about the uh, you know uh, the uh, United States. One of the risks I think of the United States and the Internet of Things is we have this huge tail we're dragging behind us, right? The the legacy of of hardware and software and systems and skills. And if you look over at, uh, my daughter was in Thailand this year and, and she was amazed when she came back when she was in kind of primary cities about the amount of automation that was available to her in Thailand where she couldn't get that in San Francisco. She was like, what? Dad, what's going on here? And I said, not my job, sweetheart. Um, so, uh, 
So the, the, my point here is that, that there is this, you know, as a, as a pragmatist, right, there is, I, I really, in a technologist, I, I love new technology, but pragmatically, particularly in organizations that need to manage that information, there's this very large gap between our ability to kind of bring that stuff in and our, really, our ability to control it and manage it. So um, I, I suggest, though, that there is, there's a middle ground. And um, it's uh, uh, Dan Castro uh, said earlier in his briefing, he said, the uh, Internet of Things means better data, and better data equals better decisions. And in fact, the tagline of my company is better data, better decisions. Right? That's the, it is literally the business that we are in. Um, and the, the, the way that we, we make better decisions about this is by just starting to understand, right? The first step in this process is what I would term measurement, right? Forget about trying to manage it, right? Trying to control all the devices that may get adopted. How about just knowing what devices are there, right? Step one, right? And the, the, the first, uh, admit you have a problem, if you will, right? Um, and, and, and Dan also said, you know, uh, the, uh, Peter Drucker's famous line, right, you can't manage what you can't measure, but you, you must be able to measure these things first. And this pattern, basically, that, and it is a pattern that BDNA utilizes in our enterprise IT space around hardware software and the purchase of hardware and software, is the same thing we're bringing to medical devices and, and Internet of Things. And the, kind of that first step is I got to be able to understand what's in that environment so I can make sense of it, so I can associate with that, you know, enrich data about the uh, about the, uh, the the sensor, the the phone, the car, the toaster, whatever the case might be, uh, so we can bring some sense to it. And what this helps us to do on that journey, basically, is is first and foremost, it kind of bridges that gap between the kind of rapid adoption of these technologies and our ability to manage it. Um, it doesn't eliminate risk, but what it does do is it reduces our risk because we have better information to make better decisions, basically, right? Oh, my God, we brought in all these sensors. Uh, we brought in all these devices. These devices have just incurred a security vulnerability of some kind. How many of them do we have in the, in the environment? What do we have to do about it, right? So let's not start a fire unless we actually know that there's something to burn. Uh, it will help us identify inefficiencies, not rectify those inefficiencies, but identify the inefficiencies. Why is it that we're spending so much time like lashing these things together? Uh, and, and finally, uh, it helps us to control costs, right? Again, not reduce costs, but control costs. And that's a, it's a very important step to get to the point where when we can manage these devices, we are in a position to um, uh, you know, reduce risk. We are in a position to eliminate inefficiencies or gain more efficiency, and we're in a position to actually uh, reduce the cost. But there's an interim step in there where we want to take advantage of that, of that steep cost curve, and the, kind of the, the best part of IT is, the, is that steep you know, adoption curve, and it's, the, it's also the bane of our existence, right? Those, those two things collide with one another. Um, so, uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the middle ground, basically, is that I think as from a very pragmatic standpoint, we want to bring these technologies in. We want to eventually be able to manage them, but we've got to be able to at least measure the environments while, where, we are, uh, where we are today. So um, just a, a, a quick keep calm and let's get started. Um, uh, first and foremost, um, one thing you cannot do is stick your head in the sand. Right? The, um, who knows how long the iPad has been around? Anyone? Just throw out a number. Number of years. Eight, right? Ten people like? Five years. It's only been five years since the iPad was released, uh, April 3rd, 2000, uh, uh, 2010. Think about your, your immediate reaction to that. It was like, well, I've, I've always had this thing. Right, but it's it's not been that way. It's just been five years, and it's just because that curve and that adoption curve is so steep that you're like, of course, you know, my kid's like, where's the iPad? Right, you know, like it's ridiculous. Um, so we have to embrace that velocity of the market and the adoption of these uh, of these new technologies, um, uh, because if we don't, it's it, it, you know, we will fall further and further behind. The the tail, the legacy that that we drag with us is uh, uh, is uh, is going to overwhelm us. So. Um, you know, uh, you know, once more into the breach, right? We have to go forward. Uh, second thing, you got to start with the basics, right? You've got to start with the basics of understanding what is in the environment, what you are bringing in. And again, this is not a problem of, of uh, you know, what we run into with the adoption of radios or TVs, per se, maybe a handful of organizations do, you know, but consumer devices because they individually manage. But as organizations, as, uh, you know, the, the state of Tennessee or as the U.S. Postal Service, you have a responsibility, you have a set of assets, basically, uh, internet-connected assets, which are your responsibility. 
right? And so you need to at least understand what they are, what are they doing, so on. Not necessarily, okay, I'm gonna go turn dials on them, but really understand what's in that environment. Uh, and then the, the last thing um, I, would, uh, I would leave you with here today um, to, to stay on time for my 10 minutes is um, demand it works, right? And, and my point on this is the amount if, if I could buy one thing for the next five years to make a ton of money in Internet of Things, it would be snake oil because a ton of it is going to get sold, right? Um, the, the, the promises um, that are going to be made uh, are going to be just stunning. Um, and um, the, the trough of disillusionment on, on those uh, investments is going to be remarkably deep. Um, so I think it is fair uh, at this day and age um, with technologies the way they are, the way these technologies can be adopted, that we don't be buying into systems that, have, uh, that we just assume are going to work. I think it is absolutely necessary to demand of, and I say this from the commercial side, to demand of the commercial marketplace that these technologies work, that you can see them live, and perhaps most importantly, that you can see them at scale. Right? Because it is, it is one thing to come in here and, and show you a toaster and like, hey, look, your toast is brown, right? Pops it up. That's great. Do that for, you know, 50,000 toasters across an entire, um, you know, an entire organization, right? That, that is, you know, can we operate these systems at scale? So uh, with that, I will, uh, I, will uh, I guess uh, you're going to come up here and ask me a couple questions. Uh, I'll start with, uh, it's a lot of toast, 50,000. That's a lot of toast. Um, <laughs> I, I keep coming back to the mindset because you guys see a lot of this. Do you walk into organizations and you immediately know, okay, they're going to really struggle or they kind of get it? And if so, the folks who get it, what do they get? Okay, uh, that's a loaded question. Um, so when we walk. Show up at events like this, number one. But right, right, absolutely. So I think the mindset is. Um, uh, I think it was uh, it was Bill Wallace who said there is a there is a natural curiosity in organizations and you see it in uh, the individuals the, the the leadership individuals of organizations which is a it's a cultural element of an organization that wants to adopt new technologies and take advantage of it um, and uh, I, I actually while I was a technologist for most of my career. Um, it is something I look for, but I, now I weigh that against the pragmatic aspects of it, right? Which is that, you know, there is real cost associated with these investments, and but there is real gain to be had. And I think uh, both Dan and and, uh, and Kelly and uh, Will all gave some really good examples of that. So it is a mindset. It is a cultural aspect of it. I'm not sure it's something that can be uh, it can be uh, uh, it can be embedded into an organization, though. It's got to be found. It's definitely uh, absolutely uh, is. E-N-A, since I think I got none of those things right the last time, <laughs> I'll get the, all three of them right.